I'm Zach Spindler Craig, a reporter for the Scarlet and Black newspaper. We're joined today by Josh Paul, former director of Congressional and Public Affairs within the Bureau of Political Military Affairs in the U.S. Department of State. He resigned from the role on October 17th, writing in a public resignation letter that he felt the transfer of American weapons to Israel was, quote, short-sighted, destructive, and unjust. He has expanded on this decision to resign in interviews with CNN, the BBC, and PBS. Thank you for joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much. You Great to be here in Grinnell. Yes. We have a few questions, sort of broader picture, about the contours of the war and your decision to resign, and potentially a few questions more specific to Grinnell and some of the, the action that we've seen, both by student protesters and by the administration. You bet. So uh, the first question that we have for you today is what ultimately motivated your decision to post your resignation letter publicly and what has your response been to just the, the abundance of media attention that you've received subsequently? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I won't go over the basics too much, but again, my, my decision to resign in the first place was, was in the context of uh, Israel's response to Hamas's attacks of October 7th and the massive civilian casualties that we're seeing in Gaza. You know, my role in political military affairs was specifically involved in approving arms sales. Um, and so, uh, you know, faced with the sort of decisions that I was being asked to make, uh, as well as with a, a long track record here, uh, both of civilian casualties in Gaza as a result of Israeli operations with US weapons, uh, but also of a failed policy process, uh, and the absence of a debate, uh, I felt I had to resign. And it was the absence of a debate, really, uh, that was what led me to post my, my resignation statement on LinkedIn. I didn't expect uh, mm -hmm. it would get the sort of response it has. I didn't think of LinkedIn as uh, a sort of the website where things go viral, yeah. right? Um, but um, I, I did want to explain, particularly to colleagues uh, and, and to friends, you know, why I had stepped down after 11 years and what mm -hmm. my concerns were uh, in a way that I couldn't do, uh, you know, internal uh, to the department because there was, then, again, no audience for it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then the response I've had has really been, you know, pretty overwhelming. Mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of people around the world uh, reaching out uh, with, with incredible messages of, of mm -hmm. support, really touching, uh, but also from former colleagues, uh, many of whom yeah. I didn't actually know, but both within the executive branch and from in uh, Congress, uh, who have all said that you know, they, they understand, they agree, uh, they are finding this very difficult. They feel uh, muzzled, silenced. Um, you know, I, I think we'll talk about this, but I think that it reflects very much what you're seeing on the outside in terms of some of the public debate about this. The same is unfortunately true on the inside of government right now, and I, I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, are you willing to speak to that a little bit more? Because obviously it seems from the outside that there's almost near unanimous support of, by Washington officials mm -hmm. of aid to Israel. Yeah. Um, but you're, you're indicating that there's more internal dissent than is visible yes. to the public. Yes, and let me be clear. I mean, my, my specific resignation was not aid to Israel per se. It was lethal mm -hmm. military assistance. Yeah. Uh, I think defensive assistance like Iron Dome, uh, is, it certainly makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we should be thinking about defense of civilian populations both in Israel and in Gaza. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, you know, it was on the lethal support that I, I, I resigned. And yes, I mean, I think I think there is a big gap, I think, between where the government professional civil services <laughs> and for that matter where the American people are, if you look at a lot of the polling, versus where elected representatives and sort of political appointees are. Mm -hmm. uh, and the conflict in the last month has really crystallized that gap, uh, I think, and really made it much more visible in terms of just how far apart uh, you know, a lot of the American population is, and certainly the professional civil services, mm -hmm. from sort of the, the top decision making levels in government. Mm -hmm. When you first brought up some of those questions or criticisms, what was the response internally? Uh, so a couple of people, uh, you know, reached out internally to say they agreed with me. I, I brought these concerns up. I mean, I've been I've been bringing up concerns not only about Israel but about many countries in the context of human rights concerns, uh, but including Israel for for a long time. Uh, but in the post October seventh context, when I, I brought up these concerns, uh, as I say, some people did reach out privately to say, "Good for you," and keep pushing. Um, but the official response was, was silence and, you know, keep, keep pushing arms rather than keep pushing the debate. Yeah. And uh, as you alluded to, there have been other questions during your 11 years yes. at the State Department about aid to Egypt, for example, mm -hmm. or, or arms sales to Saudi Arabia. Yep. And why do you feel that, that this situation in particular was the final straw? Yeah. What, what, what made it different? I mean, you mentioned Egypt and Saudi Arabia, but certainly also outside the Middle East yeah. as well. I mean, there are plenty of countries with which the U.S. has a partnership that involves at some level defense trade uh, where there are human rights concerns. Uh, what was different here was two things. It was first of all the scale in terms of what we are seeing in Gaza right now. 
um, and the immediacy of it, uh, yeah. the knowledge that we're providing on directly into that conflict, uh, and second of all, the inability to have any sort of policy discussion within the executive branch or within Congress, which is unprecedented. Uh, you know, on all of these previous issues, um, there has been space for discussion, debate, uh, steps that can be taken to mitigate some of the worst potential outcomes, um, votes in Congress against potential arms transfers, um, but in this case, there was just no appetite for that discussion inside government. Mm -hmm. If you were asked to hypothesize about what the timeline for a potential ceasefire or what, what may just happen at all in, yeah. the, in the coming weeks and potentially months of this conflict, what, what do you think may happen? And, and is there a realistic situation where the U.S. actually reduces or completely ends aid to Israel? Yeah, so I mean, one of the first things they teach you in government is that if you're in a public setting, you don't comment on hypotheticals, but I'm not in government, so I will. Um, so, I mean, I think, look, I, I, the course we're on now, I don't see that Israel has any particular interest in a ceasefire. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been some slight indications the US is beginning to push them in that direction. I, mm -hmm. I just don't see it happening, frankly, for at least, I would imagine the next two weeks at least, mm -hmm. uh, if not longer. Um, and then I think the bigger question is, and then what? You know, once mm -hmm. this conflict, this immediate conflict is over, mm -hmm. uh, how on earth do, you know, is re Gaza reconstructed? Uh, how on earth are humanitarian supplies built in? But, but how is Gaza governed, I think, is the bigger question. Mm -hmm. uh, and right now it seems like we're again just going to be back on this loop where we start all over again and we'll do this again in five years, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just don't think that's a, a feasible path that is, you know, least to security for Israel, let alone for the Palestinians. Mm -hmm. It feels like sort of the complexities of opinions about the war have, mm -hmm. have partially been lost and it's hard to, people have sort of been broken up into the two camps yes. of being pro-Israel or pro-Palestine. You have obviously been very vocal about the con condemnation of the initial Hamas attack. Yeah. Um, what, what do you feel like is the challenge with sort of all of the different complexities and, and acknowledging difficulty and, and violence on both sides of, of the spectrum. So, so two things on that. I think, first of all, yes, it is a very complex situation. Yes, there is a lot of nuance. At the same time, it's actually not that complex, right? I mean, you know, Israel's occupation of the West Bank, of its siege of Gaza, uh, these are, are not, and the actions that it's taking right now in terms of the massive civilian casualties, these are not complexities, and we should not be bogged down by concerns about you know, well, I'm not an expert, therefore I shouldn't comment. Some things are pretty apparent here. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, I, I think we do um, get ourselves off uh, in the wrong direction when we start to say that any criticism of Israel is, is you know, anti-Israeli. Mm -hmm. uh, there is absolutely space for constructive debate and dialogue, and we owe it uh, to any partner of ours uh, to provide not just, you know, arms and no questions, mm -hmm. uh, but questions and guidance. Uh, and I think we also need to be careful not to confuse... Uh, Israeli uh, interests with mm -hmm. the Benjamin Netanyahu government's interests. Yeah. Uh, those are two very different things, and Netanyahu's interests are not necessarily Israel's. Yeah. Do you see a world in which this can be resolved while maintaining a two-state system? So, I, I understand that that remains the goal, and certainly the Palestinian national aspiration. Uh, I am deeply skeptical if you look at, for example, a map of the West Bank, mm -hmm. Uh, and the settlement infrastructure that now exists, how viable uh, a Palestinian state in the West Bank actually is. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this is a question you know, that has to be negotiated between the two sides, uh, and it has to be negotiated uh, on, on a basis of equality between mm -hmm. the two sides. It can't be negotiated, I think, as it has been for the last 20 years, as Israel being the one who decides what the Palestinians get. There has to be pressure uh, to, to equalize that discussion and to put the two sides on equal footing. Otherwise, we're never going to get to a, an equitable solution. Mm -hmm. in, in the absence of an immediate ceasefire or the U.S. deploying mm -hmm. troops, what would you implement as the next step to reduce the humanitarian toll that we're seeing? Um, so I think the U.S. has a lot of leverage here that it is not using. You know, we saw Secretary Blinken over the weekend, um, you know, talking about humanitarian pauses. Um, and talking about the need for humanitarian aid, but at the same time as the New York Times and Wall Street Journal reported yesterday, we also saw Secretary Blinken or, or the State Department notifying Congress of a sale of uh, precision guided munitions kits uh, to Israel last week. Uh, so if we are not using the leverage we have to push Israel uh, to hold back, uh, whether that be through a ceasefire, whether that be through uh, a change in approach, 
uh, we are failing both Israel and ourselves. We also have a, a number of policies and laws that apply to the transfer of arms. Um, and I don't think I'm suggesting, I'm not suggesting um, that Israel should be treated any, differently to any other country. I'm <laughs> suggesting it should be treated the same as any other country. And if we apply our own guidelines uh, in terms of human rights vetting, uh, in terms of what units can receive US assistance, uh, in terms of you know, whether it is appropriate to provide arms into a situation where they will result in massive civilian casualties, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we'd be at least heading off in the right direction. Yeah, you, you brought up the separation of Netanyahu from mm -hmm. Israeli citizens and, and Jews yeah. themselves. What do you feel is important about that distinction and also what can be done specifically about Netanyahu moving forward? So, I mean, Israeli domestic politics are, are Israeli domestic politics. And, you know, theoretically, at least, the U.S. tries not to get involved in foreign domestic politics. I think we can all agree there's a bit, a bit more gray space there. Um, but, you know, I mean, we saw over the summer massive protests, massive protests in Israel against the Netanyahu government's efforts on, quote-unquote, judicial reform, uh, or essentially sort of centralization of power and, and shift towards a more autocratic system. Uh, you know, I, I think the U.S. should be speaking up for democracy and for democratic rights, uh, as we did prior to the summer, uh, we should also be speaking up for human rights when it comes to Palestinians, where we seem to be a little more hesitant uh, to make the same sort of declarative statements that we did when it came to judicial reform. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you've also been involved, or you were involved in aid to Ukraine, mm -hmm. and it seems quite clear that Biden is going to continue to try to package those, those yes. aid uh, together, both to Israel and to Ukraine. Do you think that um, will continue to be a, a viable solution, and will that continue to garner more support than packaging them separately? I mean, I think it's frankly, just pragmatically and politically speaking, the only way it's going to work if you want to get assistance to Ukraine, and I, I actually do support military assistance to Ukraine. I think these yeah. are you know, two very different situations. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, if it was up to the House majority, they passed their Israel package just now, and I think that's all they would pass if it was up to them. Mm -hmm. uh, so if these aren't all kept together, um, then, then the Ukraine peace won't go forward. Mm -hmm. Well, turning to a couple of more local issues, um, the Grinnell chapter of Students for Justice in Palestine recently published a list of demands for the Grinnell College administration. Um, and in those demands, it included uh, the immediate divestment from any investments that mm -hmm. financially support Israel um, and the release of a statement that calls for a ceasefire and acknowledges the acts of genocide that are occurring. Um, the college has remained relatively quiet, uh, specifically related to the war and, and related to the demands. Uh, my question for you is, do you feel that there is a place for institutions like Grinnell to take more significant action against the violence occurring in Israel and Gaza? Yes, and let me just start by, by noting that the first thing Grinnell is doing and, and has to keep doing is allowing the space for this debate. Uh, in just the last 24 hours, we've seen Students for Justice in Palestine be banned yeah. uh, at Brandeis University. Uh, and I think it's really vital that colleges remain a, say, a space where these debates can happen. Uh, and, you know, what I've, I've seen is, is an immense amount of censorship, both within government and in academia. And frankly, I've heard from a lot of people uh, in the private sector who say, I would love to be speaking up on this, but I will lose my job yeah. uh, if, if I do. And that sort of intimidation, frankly... Uh, is is un-American and not constructive. And so mm -hmm. the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, Grinnell must, I hope, uh, keep, keep the door open and let these conversations continue. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of what decisions the university itself takes, mm -hmm. um, I think that is up to the university and uh, hopefully would be what decision set that is taken in consultation with the student body and that follows the wishes of the student body. Yeah. Well, you also alluded to this, this fact that many demonstrators, uh, especially students on, on college campuses, have been targeted and mm -hmm. some have had job offers rescinded Correct. or they've been doxxed mm -hmm. and their information spread. Right. What, is, what is your reaction to yeah, that? Yeah, it's outrageous. I mean, I, I've heard, I've just spoken in the last couple of weeks with students from across the country uh, who have, you know, experienced incidents, for example, where they have protested and then their names, you know, photos have been taken mm -hmm. and then their faces put up on the internet mm -hmm. and, you know, this absurd allegation that, you know, protesting for a ceasefire, protesting against occupation mm -hmm. is somehow uh, tantamount to terrorism. Of course it's not. It is free and fair debate uh, in support of what is ultimately a humanitarian agenda and in support of, you know, as I've said, I think a humanitarian agenda that ultimately benefits both mm -hmm. Palestinians and Israelis. Mm -hmm. uh, so this effort to shut it down is just deeply, deeply disappointing and concerning. Mm -hmm. You indicated that you've received widespread support for your decision. I imagine that you've also received significant criticism. 
Have you, can you just speak to that? Yeah, one? I mean, actually, I mean, pretty limited criticism that I've mm. seen. And I think part of the reason for that, right, is that is that I'm only on LinkedIn. I don't have any other social media. <laughs> yeah. And you have to have your name attached to what you say. And I think people uh, are more reticent to be, you know, mean uh, when they have to sign their name by it. Uh, you know, certainly there's been, you know, some quarters where there's been some pushback. And that's fine. Again, uh, you know, so long as it is rational, respectful, uh, you know, th there should be space for disagreement. That's how we have, you know, that's how we come to better understandings and better policy decisions is mm -hmm. through disagreement and through hashing things out. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine that you wrote the resignation letter not thinking that it was going to get so much attention. If you were to go back knowing that you were going to receive a lot of media attention subsequently, would you have voiced anything differently in the letter? No, I don't think so. Uh, I think it captured exactly what I was thinking at the time and what I continue to think and believe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to be clear, you know, I didn't, it wasn't a sort of snap of the fingers, you know, right, that's it, I'm out of here. I, after uh, October 7th, I took a, a significant amount of time, I mean, a, a week and a half, which, you know, in, in, in the context of the speed of the arms transfers and all that is, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes to see how things were playing out, uh, to, to understand what our response was going to be, to see how uh, the conflict in Gaza was shaping. Um, and during that time, I sort of drafted my resignation note and then, edited it, then watched for a day to see what was happening, and then came back to it. Um, so I think it captures pretty well uh, what I was trying to say. Yeah. I think my last question for you is, again, related to Iowa. Um, essentially, the, the group equivalent to like a Campus Democrats group at the University of Iowa mm -hmm. recently re released a, a pro-Palestine statement. And at the end of the statement, they signed it, from the river to the sea, Palestine mm -hmm. will be free. Um, after that, the, the Iowa Democratic Party released a statement calling for their resignation mm -hmm. over the use of that phrase. Yeah. Um, reaction to that situation? Uh, so if you look at the founding charter of Benjamin Netanyahu's Likud party, uh, mm -hmm. it says that its goal is a sovereign uh, state of Israel from the sea to the River Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, so when people say from the river to the sea, I understand that there is a, a lot of complexity and nuance depending on what the context is in which they're saying it. Mm -hmm. But we never raise the same concerns when the Israelis say exactly the same thing. Uh, so I just think we need to stay balanced on this. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us today. We, we certainly appreciate you taking the time. Thank, Thank you, you for much. having me.